Hello everybody, welcome back to Friday's Live. I hope you're having a really good day. Happy Friday. How good is it? Does it how how good does it feel to get to the end of the week? I am so, so, so excited just to kick back, relax, and not do very much at all over the weekend, apart from maybe a little smattering of family history of course. My name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Farmer Past. I will be your host this Farmer Past Friday. Please do say hello in the comments. Tell me where you're tuning in from today. Tell me what the weather is like with you. It is, it's felt very spring-like in Edinburgh this week. It, the sun's been shining. I went out the other day. No, it was just yesterday, in fact. I did, had a stroll down to the shop over my lunch break and didn't even feel like I needed my coat. Of course, it's set to turn wintry again this weekend and I would much rather the, the spring weather now, please. I'm very, very ready for spring to spring to sprung spring to spring that doesn't sound right anywho let's welcome some of you in the comments we've got lots of familiar faces here which is great uh, we've got Gillian joining us hello Daphne got caught in a hailstorm oh dear I hope you're inside and dry and and warm now uh, we've got Andrea joining us from a chilly Stoke on Trent. We've got Victoria. Hello. Lots of you here. This is lovely. Um, we've also got Daisy with us in the comments today. Please say hi to Daisy. And just to let you guys know, next week I managed to strong arm Daisy into co-hosting Friday's Live with me next week. So I'm so excited. It's going to be Daisy's Find My Pass From Home debut. Um, Daisy is our uh, brand researcher and copywriter and um, she does some great work. You'll have seen lots of our blogs. She's been working on those. She writes a lot of emails for us as well. And she's a bit of a history nerd like all of us. So <laughs> she's going to be really good. And um, she knows the new records every week very, very well because she writes the blog and the email. So, yeah, it's going to be a really good chance to introduce everybody to Daisy. And she's absolutely lovely. You will love her. And, of course, all of you will be lovely as well. So, yeah, it's all good stuff. Um, OK, I'm still seeing lots of people coming in. This is great. Hello, 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 hello. Um, oh, did anybody catch Jen's live session on Wednesday with Blame Bettinger? How good was it? It was all about using AI and things like chat GPT that I can never say quickly correctly. Um, so AI resources for family history research is sort of a springboard, not to do your entire family tree, uh, but just to, it's a, it's a research tool, right? And it was a fascinating session. I only caught the last half an hour of it because I had a, a meeting at three o'clock, so I couldn't, couldn't uh, go to the entire thing, which was a shame. But if, if any of you missed it or like me, you only saw half of it, you can catch up on any of our live sessions at any time from our YouTube page or from the video section of our Facebook page. So, yes. Yeah. In terms of what we're going to do today, we're going to do some new records and new newspapers. We're going to do question of the week, which is if you could see any new feature added to find my past, what would it be and why? The why is the really key thing here that I want to know. So there might be something that you think, oh, I really wish find my past would have this option or this product or this feature, big or small. OK. I want to hear the why behind it, because that's going to really help when I take this long list of things to our product team and say, hey, our community would love this. They're going to want the why. So how would it help you? What problem would it solve for you? That's the key thing. OK, so that's the question of the week. And then what we're also going to do is I'm going to do a little tutorial. And the tutorial this week is going to be a mini crash course on the 1939 register. I say mini, um, I was going to be mini in my head. I think it's actually going to be quite a big tutorial, but I will try and keep it nice and um, digestible because we want this to be nice and nice and easy going, nice and lighthearted. And I just hope it will be of use to you. And then the last thing we'll do before we finish up for the weekend is I want to take you on a optional journey down rabbit holes. And there is a purpose for this. We're going to be doing a specific type of rabbit hole using one record set. 
and using that to springboard into record sets that you might not have thought of for your own research, basically. So I want you all, all to come along on a journey with me. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, yeah. Shall we do new records? Yes, there's lots to get through this week. I'm very excited. Okay, so here we go. New records, lots, lots to get through. We have released, I'm going to be looking at my other screen where I've got my slides. Uh, we've released uh, 1.7 million new records and newspaper pages this week. That's a big week. Um, in terms of what we've released, we've got the anglo um enrolment forms, local enrolment forms. We've got East Surrey Regiment records, Queen's Royal West Kent Regiment records, four new newspaper titles and updates to a further 54. Now, because a lot of the military records that we've released this week, because they have a little bit of a an anglo Boer War focus, I thought it'd be really good just to touch briefly on what the anglo Boer War was. So it's also known as the Second Boer War, and it was fought between 1899 and 1902. It was a conflict between the British Empire and two of the Boer Republics. Um, so you've got the South African Republic and then you've got the Orange Free State. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but very, very, very generally, um, the British sort of weaseled their way in a little bit. They were seen as invaders. The two republic, two Boer republics didn't like that. And there was a conflict. There was a war. Um, you had the Boers using things like guerrilla tactics. And then you had the British using, um, they employed, employed like a, um, a scorched earth policy. That drove, uh, displaced a lot of people. They ended up in concentration camps, for example. Uh, a lot of people suffered as a result. And the war ended in uh, 1902. So there we go. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that, as I just said. But um, that's very, very brief background for you. So in terms of the local um, enrolment forms, so these are a brand new record collection to the site this week. There's over 64,000 records to explore. These are unique to Farmer Pass. And these are the original enrolment forms that were catalogued, that are, excuse me, are catalogued in W0126 at the National Archives. In terms of what they are, they are the enrolment forms of men who were who enlisted in units raised in South Africa for this war, during the war. And they contain things like the man's age, their nationality, their trade, their date and place of enrolment, sometimes the discharge date. Um, and you get that oath of allegiance as well. What you should normally find as well are their regimental unit, their religion, height, weight, next of kin and their home address. These are actually very detail rich transcriptions. Now, the reason I put this one on screen as my little example is because um, my aunt, my father's sister, um, is busy trying to track down details about a, a lady called Winifred Oates. She was born Jones. I, I believe she was my great grandfather's sister. So born Winifred Jones and she married an Oates and apparently she died in South Africa in something like, it would have been from about between 1990 and the present day. I don't know the exact date. Anyway, so I thought, oh, I, I don't have any, personally have any relatives who went to South Africa, I don't think. So um, I will try using oats just in case. And lo and behold, there was one. And it was this guy. It was the record for William Charles Oates. He was 36. Um, and it tells me that he was a Mason, that he was British. He enlisted at Cape Town into the Mine Guard Rand Rifles, I think. It gives me his wife's name, which is Ada Jane Oates. Um, I think, yes, his wife, yes, it does actually say wife, which is very, very key. Um, it gives me their address, which is 5 Virginia Street. And I have definitely already passed this on to my aunt, just in case it is the, uh, the same Oates family that my grandfather's, sis, great, excuse me, my great grandfather's sister married into it gets very complicated i should have drawn a family tree but yes now of course i always look at one of these and i always think oh i'd have to go and find out some more details um so i found the guy in cornwall on the eight this is the 1861 census with his um with his family his father was also a stonemason uh william charge was william charles was 16 at this time he was already a stonemason 
so yeah they were from Cornwall and that actually rung a bell for me I'm pretty sure that when I when I have been talking to my aunt about Winifred and the Oates family she married into I'm pretty sure they were from Cornwall but I've emailed her to double check Uh, I could be but completely barking up the wrong tree um but I was wondering as well I went and had a little look in the newspapers and there was a death record for a nine-year-old William Charles Oates son of William Charles Oates um and he died in in 1902 so if this is the same guy um they must have come back to Cornwall by 1902 once the war had ended so yeah we'll just see if it's of use to her really Next up, we've got the East Surrey Regiment for 1899 to 1919. This is an existing record collection, and we've added another 41,000 records. Some are just transcript only. Some are image and transcript. And they cover three different sets of records, this one collection. So you've got the Boer War Medals, the 1st Battalion Part 2 Orders, and then you've got the 1st Battalion Rank and File Index. So slightly different information for all three of those. So normally for the medals, you'll get a name, a year, a service number, a rank, a regiment, company, and then any additional remarks. For the 1st Battalion orders, you'll normally find the same. You might get extra particulars um, and typically the enlistment date. Be aware with these, some of them only include the soldier's first initial and their surname, not their full name. And I just wanted to show you one example. Um, So this is a record for a George Ayton service number two, excuse me, 8240. And there are several records for this G. George Ayton. So this is one from 1915 and it tells me he was admitted to hospital. Um, then it says departures to England on this one. And then you've got, by this point, he's a Lance Corporal in 1917, and it tells me he was wounded. Um, and then you've got another departures to England one in 1917 as well. So we can actually use, when there's uh, multiple records for the same person in this, in this collection, you can actually track a little bit more of their time as a soldier. But because I've got G8 and you might think, oh, a bit difficult to to narrow that down. There's no birth year or anything like that on these records. But there is one extra little bit of detail that you can use. Take the service number. And if we use that, we can actually find his medical record in a completely different record collection. So this is from when he was wounded in 1917. Um, And it tells me that he was admitted to the 14th Field Ambulance Hospital on the 10th of April 1917 and he was 21 years old so that then helps me get the extra bit of detail which is his rough birth year and it actually also tells me I don't know if I'm reading this correctly but I think he had some sort of injury to his back but I can't quite work out what it says it looks like it says ICT to me I think I could be wrong um I also see sort of ICT foot for some other people. I don't know what ICT means. If anybody knows, please tell me. I'm very interested. Okay, next up, we have the Queen's Royal West Surrey Regiment records. And again, this is an existing collection, and we've added 85,000 records to this one. Again, some of them are transcript only, and some are transcript and image. And there are again there are three smaller series in this bigger collection so you've got prisoners of war from 1918 registers of register of recruits and then you've also got Boer war medals um i absolutely love this picture by the way uh officers of the uh of the regiment i thought that was a very smart picture uh here's an example record for you this is the record for leonard ayton of tooting in london born in London, um, and his service number number was 8029. And he was actually a prisoner of war in 1914, as we can see from this next record here. There we go. Exciting stuff. And as a total aside, I put this in just because I love looking at vintage wedding dresses. When I was looking for an image of the Queen's Royal West Surrey Regiment, in the newspapers, uh, I came across this beautiful bridal portrait of um, 
Ellen Tweed, when she married Lieutenant Richard Hayes Twining in 1915, he was of that particular regiment. I just absolutely love this uh, this photograph of her, which is beautiful, so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, in terms of newspapers, I'm not going to touch on these very much um, because a lot's been added and I might be here all day. But we've added 1.6 million pages, four new titles and updates to a further 54. The new titles are The Cambly News, The Grimsby Target, The Luton on Sunday and The Wrexham and Mould Mail, one that's a little bit more local to where I grew up, actually. So there we go. That's uh, that's what's new this week. I hope you guys enjoy getting stuck into those. OK, shall we do question of the week? I'm just going to pop it on screen just in case anybody's missed it. So if you could see any new feature added to find my past, what would it be and why? So I'm going to scroll all the way back up to the top and I'm going to see what you guys are asking for. Let's have a look. I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. I don't know why I, was, I have, always have to sing I'm scrolling. But, um... Okay, so new features. Um, so Janen's asking for Irish records from the 18th century and earlier. They must exist somewhere. We can do a whole other um, session on when we ask for requested records. What I'm really after this time is features. Like what's going to make your life easier when you're building your family tree on Farmer Past and searching the records. So I saw somebody put, I think it might have been Matt asking for a dark mode. That's the kind of thing I'm after today. Um, but we can do we can do records another time, I think. Um, okay, Kim says a minus feature in searches. For example, when looking for the surname Fuchsia, I want to omit results with Fisher. Yes, I like that very much indeed. That is a good suggestion. Yes, it was. Here we go. New features, dark mode required for the app and the website. I know I've mentioned it many times before, why it helps with visual processing, disabilities, etc. Yes, um, this is, I think this is currently, I think I've definitely passed this on to our product team and they are very interested. So keep think, fingers crossed for this one. Um, okay, 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 okay. Liam says, I put everything into dark mode, so I'm right there with you, Matt. Do you know what? I used to be one of these people. I used to have everything in dark mode, and I am slowly moving back to putting everything in light mode. I don't know why. Um, I think I think I just prefer it that way. But it's nice to have the option, right? It's nice to have the option. Jen saying, I love searching by service number. Yes, it's so good. It's so good. Because typically when you're sometimes searching a military record it's it's uh it might not be very detail rich but the thing you normally have is that service number and if you've got the service number you can unlock so much else in other records um thank you matthew icc's infantry training center maybe maybe it was the regiment oh maybe 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 um Okay, Andrew says, perhaps a method of allowing wildcards in newspaper searches. I currently check half a dozen variants for name and I'm probably missing out on lots where the journalist got it wrong. Yes, this is great. Um, I can't give too much away. I'll get told off. But watch this space. I'm just hoping Jen, Liam and, Liam and Daisy who are watching um, don't go and, tell, go and tell me off now. It's all right. Uh, Jen says, um, some kind of feature that I can add to my tree timeline, attach records to maps and attach trees to the same map. Yes, love a map, love a map. Jenny says, I would love to be able to see who the tree owner is when I get a match. Not being able to see who it mean is means you may just be messaging other people you've already had contact with. I think we, we do. We have recently introduced this, I think. Liam and um, Jen might know better than me, but I think that's now a thing. I don't want to say for certain, just in case I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, Liam and Jen, if you could um, help Jenny out for me, I'd be very, very, very grateful. Daphne, what Jen said. Yes, love a map. We love a map. Um, 
Matthew says, a tool for scanning a page of text in and getting a translation. Ooh, I have found a number of printed records in old books in Latin, Old English, and even legal shorthand. Google has problems reading it, and so do I. A scan and translate would be very useful for many. Oh, that would be so good. That would be so good. I know on our app we have we have a feature where you can take a picture of a document or a headstone and it will transcribe it for you but I don't think it will translate it for you. I don't think it will. I thought it sounds very advanced. But how good would that be? I would absolutely love that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Um, and Kim saying, I like to trace my ancestors' movements through maps. So including this with the record too would be helpful to have in one place. I agree. Like we've got on some of our record collections, um, Mainly the censuses, I think, we have on the transcriptions, we have maps where it pinpoints where the uh, the address is, for example. And I know um, on other record types, such as, you know, like, like a baptism, for example, or a military record, it won't give you an exact location, like an address. But it's sometimes nice to it's sometimes nice to be able to contextualise where that is if you're not too familiar with it. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I often find myself opening up um, maps on my computer if I don't know where something is and trying to see it, normally in relation to how far it is from another location. I end up doing that quite a lot. Okie doke, keep those coming in um, if there's any more that you think of as we um, carry on today. So any features on fa you, that you'd love to see on Family Past that we could potentially add to make your experience of researching your ancestors with us easier or smoother or less of a headache? Because so let's be honest, sometimes researching our ancestors can be a little bit of a headache. Let's let's make this process better. Basically, we always will want to you to have a good experience when you are on our website. Okay, the next thing I wanted to look at today. Excuse me, I want to do a little crash course on the nineteen thirty nine register. So I'm just going to add my slides again. There we go. So. 1939 crash course okay so grab your notebooks grab your pens I'm sure that with many of you as with many of these tutorials I'm often reiterating things that you may already know but I urge you to stick around for this anyway just in case there's one new thing that you learn that is a game changer for your research when you're using this record set so what is the 1939 register for those of you who don't know? So it was taken on the 29th of September 1939 in England and Wales. So the government could have up to date details on the population of the time. This would then help with rationing and the creation of ID cards and the like. And then plus that also included wide scale mobilization. If you think about it, right, the, the census was that was taken in 1931 was nearly a decade old by this point in 1939 so it was it was very much out of date they were already planning for the 41 census but they needed more up-to-date information now 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 so it's like a census the 1939 register is but it's not a census it doesn't fall under the 1920 census act uh, this is why in 2015, we were able to digitise it in partnership with the National Archives and release it. Fun fact, I came to Find My Past for the first time in November of 2015 as a temp to assist with the launch. So, yeah, 1939 has a, a, a warm place in my heart because of that, actually. However, unlike historic censuses, the 1939 register also contains full dates of birth. And we will come to why this is more significant in a moment. So nowadays, a document like this is hugely significant for a wide variety of people, including us, family historians or house historians. 
1931 census doesn't survive. And the 1941 census, which, as I said a moment ago, was planned for, it was never taken because of the war. So this means that between 1921, which is the most recent public census for England and Wales we have from our past, and 1951, which won't be released until 2052, because it has the 100-year rule under the 1920 Census Act, there is no other surviving snapshot of the English and Welsh population other than this document. So it, because of that, it provides a really useful window into the life of um, everybody living in England and Wales just as the Second World War began. Plus, I, uh, I must point out that the uh, because we digitise the register from paper in partnership with the National Archives, we at PharmaCast hold the most up-to-date version of the 1939 register. And again, I will come to this a little bit more in a moment. And I think at the moment there are about 35 million, over, just over 35 million records open on it just now. So who's in it then? So we've got every civilian living in England and Wales on the 29th of September 1939, they're included. It also includes the Isle of Wight and the Isle of Man. Who's not in it? Serving military personnel. This was only for civilians. So it's not that they were added on and crossed out or anything. They just weren't recorded at all. It also doesn't include the Channel Islands. And it also doesn't include Scotland. You can, I think there's a, a, a similar record collection if you go to the national records of scotland they might be able to help and it also doesn't doesn't include northern ireland so let's have a little look shall we this is what a household looks like so if you open up a record on the 1939 register this is what the transcription looks like for a household you've got the address at the top and you've got some options there you've got viewer original record you've got add to tree you've got prints and then you've got more actions and then you've also got your copy to clipboard this is the, the household table. Um, so that's sort of minimal information from the transcription. But if you if you scroll down on this transcription, you would see the full transcription for Bessie, who is the person highlighted in, in the, the green colour. If you wanted to look at Horace instead, you could click on to Horace. That would highlight him in green. And then, for example, if you wanted to add him to the tree, you could do it from there. And you also see uh, underneath Bessie, the person for this, the, the, excuse me, the record for this person is officially closed. So more on that in a second. This is what the original images look like. Um, quite detailed, actually. So unlike with the 1911 and 1921 census, where what you see are the original household forms that were filled out by the head of the household, the 1939 register is much more uh, along the lines of the, the, the older censuses. So this was all filled out by an enumerator. And um, yeah, so you've got the address, you've got the schedule, you've got the surnames and other names. You've got male or female, you've got the birth, birthday and year. And you've also got whether they were single, married, widowed or divorced. And then you've got personal occupation. And then you've got another field that says see instructions. And you can often get some extra little detail from that, which we'll come on to in a second. So if you remember what I said a moment ago. About the 1939 register having full dates of birth. Now, as you can imagine, this is quite sensitive information. I've just lost my mouse. My apologies. There we go. It's quite sensitive information. And because the register doesn't fall under the 1920 Census Act, we needed to take some steps to protect that sensitive data for anybody who might still be alive or whose death we haven't verified yet. So this is why you might see on the register the record for this person is officially closed. And then if you go back to the um, to the original, you've got a solid black line and it says this record is officially closed. So that's why we've done that. So it's for anybody who is under 100 years old or whose death we haven't yet verified. OK. Um, 
I just want to point out as well, if we go back to the transcript, I have, of course, lost my mouse again. My apologies. Um, a little tip for you. What you'll typically find handily, not always, but in my experience, this is what I've seen. People are often listed in the following order on the form. The head, wife, children in age order and then visitors. Not always by any means, but for a typical family, that is how they would be listed in that order. So if you come across a closed record like we've got one here, we've got Horace, who's the head. We've got Bessie, his wife, and then we've got a closed record underneath. Now, I'm making an assumption here. I don't actually know. I think that's a child because typically anybody born after 1923 should be redacted because of the 100 year rule here. So I think that could be a child. Now, if there were three children in that household, there were three people listed under Horace and Bessie. And the first child was open. And the third child was open. The one in the middle closed. You can make an educated guess that that child would be younger than the first child, but older than the third one that, that appears. And you'll get because you'll get the years of birth, you'll be able to get make a rough estimate of that child's birth year. So it's not an exact science. It's not a rule of thumb. It's just what I've seen from my experience. I saw a question in the comments. I can't remember who asked it, I'm afraid. Um, how accurate were the years of birth that were given? I'd lean towards accurate. I cannot say, I cannot give a percentage. Mistakes were made. People could forget the exact date of birth, although probably unlikely. They might have needed to lie for some reason. But again, that's that's not that's not that's not typical. Um the in my experience, the most common reason for a mistake in the year of birth is because the enumerator got it wrong, <laughs> um, not because the um, the individual forgot their own birthday. It does happen. Um, but I couldn't give an estimate on, on how accurate those were. Um, so, yes. So if you do come across a record and you notice um, the record for somebody is closed and you think, I think I know who that is and I know that they passed away and I think their record should be open. If you want to get that record opened, what you can do is you can click onto more actions and then I don't know if I've gone to the right one here. I can't remember now. I can't remember how to get to the form. This is this is embarrassing. Um, but yes, you can submit an evidence of death request with us. Liam will tell us in the comments exactly how to do that. Um, so yeah, you can submit an evidence of death request to us. And uh, all you need to include are a copy of their death certificate. We will also accept a Commonwealth War Graves Commission record. And then if we if all the information matches up, we will open the record. Equally, if you notice somebody who is, their record is open, but you know them to still be alive, we need to close that record. So if you just provide us with a little bit of detail, we'll close the record um, if you submit a takedown request and you just click on the more actions and then close record. We do quarterly releases of the 1939 register where we open up records of those who have just passed 100 years old. I think from memory there is another quarterly release coming up very soon so keep your eyes peeled for that and it's not very often that the you know family history records provide full dates of birth we don't see it very often take advantage of it sometimes it can mean you don't then have to go and order a birth certificate so it'll save you a little bit of money um, unless you need to order it for another reason of course okay next thing i want to touch on is notes and crossings out and things like that so if you look at the any original documents of the 1939 register what you'll normally see is it's all written in in one pen and in one person's handwriting but then you'll get extra notes that have been written in a different a different pen different ink different handwriting 
This is because up until 1991, the 1939 register was a, it was used as a live document. Uh, it was updated with things like changes of name and things like that. And we at Pharmapass, we often get queries of why have you listed my relative with her married name? She was single in 1939. She wouldn't have married yet. Why have you done this? Um, surely it should be true to the original. Yes, absolutely. Um, but because the original was changed, not by us, but by the NHS, we have those extra little bits of detail that we can provide you with. This is a really quirky thing about the register because most of the time uh, a single woman's entry would be later updated with her married name. Not all the time, not all the time, most of the time, in my experience of what I've seen. It's super handy for us as family historians because we often get the woman's maiden name, her married name and the year of her marriage all in one place. So if we look at this one, for example, we've got Joan uh, M. Tuberville. I think that's how we say her surname. She's single in, in 1939. Of course, she is. She was born in 1935. She's under school age. And then what we can see is somebody has gone in, crossed out her surname and added Parsons on top. And they've also made some adjustments to her to her first name as well. They've actually put Joan Mary and not just Joan M or Jean Mary. It says one or the other. But then on the left hand side, if you follow the left hand left hand arrow, you've got a date there. And I, it's quite difficult to read. But I think it says the 14th of the 3rd, 57. It could be 52. I'm not entirely sure. OK, so I think what you can do with that is go and search for a Jean or a Joan Tuberville marrying Parsons surname in around either 52 or 57. If you search for that marriage, nine times out of 10, you'll get the first name of her husband. Just like that. By looking at this record and a marriage record. And you haven't had have to order a marriage certificate. Isn't that great? So, so handy. Now let's do enumeration districts. I told you this is gonna be a crash course, okay? So enumeration districts, unlike census records, the 1939 register is a little bit quirky as to how it recorded addresses. And when I used to work in the customer support team for Farmer Pass, I used to find myself explaining it in this way. Rather than a census where the address is recorded as street, town, county, on the 1939 register, you'll get street, enumeration district, county which can be quite tricky sometimes because you think you're looking for a certain town um, or you know that your ancestor lived in a certain town or a certain city or a certain village, but these weren't recorded. The, 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 the villages, the towns and the cities weren't recorded. It was all for enumeration districts. And sometimes you will end up looking in the wrong enumeration district just based on how I think it's quite bizarre how they did it, but I think if you can understand the enumeration districts a little bit more, um, it will help you in your searches. Um, Daisy's popped a link to a um, an article about enumer enumeration districts. Um, I'll just pull a couple of things out of that for you. So outside of London, there are four types of enumeration district that you'll see on the codes. So You've got uh, RD, which is rural district, UD, which is urban district, MB, which is municipal borough, and then CB, which is county borough. And then you've got the area codes. So starting at AAA in London, each area would have its own code. So at the top here, um, we've got that this was in Birmingham and the letter code was QCJH, okay? If you follow the link that Daisy's popped in the comments, there's a full list of these available. And when I mean the quirks, a lot of what we would consider to be Cambridgeshire actually comes under the Isle of Ely. Birmingham, Bristol, for example, both of these big cities straddle two counties, two or, three, well, two or more county boundaries, but they're only listed in Warwickshire and Gloucestershire, respectively. So just some things to be made just to, to make you aware of when you're searching. Um, search broadly so you don't fall into this trap. 
or have a look at the information we provided around the enumeration districts um, to hopefully combat any problems you might be having. So yes, there we go. Um, also, another little tip I picked up from my customer support days, we used to get a lot of queries about, I'm after a particular street or a village, like a rural village, like really, really rural or a hamlet in the 1939 register. I have personally found these to be quite tricky to find because of this enumeration system. So my top tip is, especially when the area or the house that you're looking for doesn't have named streets. This is this happens a lot as well. Um, open up a map on the internet. Have a look at the area that you're after and drill down as much as you can. Then go in and find the name of a street, preferably a distinctive street name. Then come back to the 1939 register and try and find that street. Once you've got that street and you know you know that's the one you're looking for because it's, because it's quite distinctive, then you can narrow down your area code and your, and your enumeration district for the little hamlet or the little village that you're looking for. And then it becomes quite a manual process then. Um, you can either try using the enumeration district and look for like the surname of the family that you're looking for, for example, or for that distinctive street, open up the book, so the original images, and start scrolling through just to see if you can find it that way. A little bit more manual, but I have six or seven times out of 10, that's worked for me. Um, oh, I'm skipping ahead of myself here. Um, before we touch on um, the institution codes, I wanted to talk about missing areas. So there's a very small number of areas that have been identified as missing from the 1939 register. Um, they are known to have been missed when the original register was taken. This very short list currently includes the western end of the parish of Eam. Um, that's in Bakewell registration, excuse me, Bakewell Rural District in Derbyshire. And that's the letter code RCCY. And then you've got a small number of streets in Erith Municipal Borough in Kent. They are Ashburnham Road, Beltwood Road, Bullbanks Road, Gordon Road, Mayfield Road and Stanmore Road in Erith Municipal Borough in Kent. Again, there is a link to the uh, page in question where it goes into more detail that Daisy has kindly put in the comments for you. However, I should point out these are the only ones that have been conclusively proved to have been missed. There may be more and there is more work ongoing to investigate. Now, let's look at institution codes. OK, so most records that you come across when you're searching the register are for households. OK. But there are also quite a few institutions. And when I say institutions, these could be hospitals, uh, prisons, schools, and so on and so forth. So what you'll notice is an extra column. There's an additional column here, and it's OVSPI. And if you notice one of these next to your ancestor's name and you're wondering what that means, I'm about to tell you. So O stands for officer, V for visitor, S for servant, P for patient, and I for inmate. It's that easy. Next up, this is quite interesting, actually. So we have made the Final Pass experience of searching this amazing resource even better. So one of my very good colleagues, and I think he had help from other colleagues too, but only one's popping to mind. Jen will be able to tell me more. Anyway, um, They've gone in and they have indexed the additional details from the register and they've taken, I can't quite explain it properly, but they've taken some codes and they've made these codes searchable and we now know what these mean. So we've indexed the civilian role field and also the special interest groups field. So you can use these to search. So examples include for the civilian role field, you've got the air raid precaution wardens, you've got auxiliary fire service. And for example, there's quite a few there. You can you can search this as well. There is a type ahead. And then for the special interest groups, go on, there we go. For the special interest groups, these can include blind, deaf, evacuee, refugee, heavy worker and Welsh language. Yes, Jen, it is Stephen who did this extra indexing work. It is 
amazing. So, for example, if you wanted to go into the 1939 register and see how many refugees or evacuees there were, that's how you can do it. All thanks to Stephen, our lovely colleague, who um, is very shy and probably wouldn't like the praise, but we're going we're we're to thank him anyway. So there we go. We've also got maps. Um, I've done a session on this before, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we have built a map search to go with the 1939 register. Isn't that handy? You can search it by postcode, by streets, even latitude and longitude. And you can also use it um, to get searched by your current location. And you can also change the map to explore what an area was like through time. I think, yeah, there we go. That's what it looks like when you search. So I just put in real and um, you can drill down by street and then by household. And it's just another way of searching it. In terms of a couple of search tips then, some things I haven't quite touched upon yet. Um, you can search the register by name and by another person in the household, address, year and date of birth, occupation, sex, location 1939, marital status, borough or district, the county, the country, the civilian role, the household or institution, special interest groups, the enumeration district letter code, piece number, item number, and occupation and keywords. That is a lot of search fields to play with. The keyword field is absolutely your, your friend if you're struggling, particularly if you have a little bit of information but you don't know what field it needs to go in, pop it in the, in the keyword field. You've also got the other household member field. This is right down the bottom of the search, field, search screen. Say if you've got quite a common name, Say if you're searching for Joan Smith, but you know Joan Smith was married to, I don't know, Donald, that will really help narrow it down for you. Remember that the register, like a census, will record where your ancestor was living, where they spent the night on the evening of the 29th of September 1939, even if this wasn't at their home address. It could have been at a hotel, it could have been at a school, it could have been at a hospital. Bear that in mind. As with any searches, I always find less is more. You can always add in more information as you go. Then you're not going to miss things. With the 1939 register, I often see middle names only written as initials. So bear that in mind. Always check the original. And if you're stuck, try browsing the books. We also have a browse version of the 1939 register. Really, really great for spotting potential family living nearby or, um, or, uh, or friends, for example. It is a really fabulous resource. There is a lot more to it than you think. This has been very much a crash course. Apologies for storming through it. Um, but it's really, really startling as well to see the difference uh, after the First World War with the 1921 census and then coming up to the just as the Second World War broke out. So, yeah, that is my 1939 register crash course. I hope you found it useful. There we go. Now, you've all been nattering as I've been going, and I still have one more thing to touch upon today. So hopefully we'll have time. Um, Victoria says, I just found a potential ancestor in an institution. Oh, let us know. Tell us more. Um, uh, Sally says, I'm looking at my grandparents in Oxford. I can see the mistakes made in some of the spellings on the transcript have been updated and corrected after I reported it. That's good. Yes, if you do spot any errors, you can issue a transcription correction to us. And if we agree with it and it matches the original, we'll correct it for you. So thank you very much to anybody who takes the time to correct those for us because it makes it, the data better. Lovely. Um, OK, right. I have one more thing I wanted to touch on today. So bear with me a second while I just um, I need to find the right window to do this. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, present share screen. Okay. There we go. OK, the last thing I wanted to do today was. I'd like you to come 
on a little bit of a journey with me. Because it's still Women's History Month, I thought I would show you something that you will probably hate me for. Um, your own family tree will probably be disregarded for the rest of the week, um, as will your Friday evening plans. You have been warned, we are going down a rabbit hole, and it might hopefully remind you to look at some more unusual places for your ancestors. I often find researching somebody who is not in my own family tree a great exercise in sharpening my skills, my research skills. I often find myself looking at resources I've never thought to look at before. And then when, it, when I come back to my own family tree, I find myself remembering about those resources and thinking, oh, look for my ancestors in there. And then I make new discoveries. I love it when that happens. So I'm not saying you, you should only research your own ancestors. You can do whatever you want. I'm just saying this is a really good way to improve your research skills. And it's a bit of fun, right? Especially if you're stuck on your own family tree. It's nice to still do the family history, but just not about your own family. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on to the 1921 census and we're going to have a little bit of a play. Uh, I want the advanced search. And because it's Women's History Month, we are going to look for women in the 1921 census with some cool occupations. That's what we're going to do. So the first one I'm going to do is, this is live demo time, genealogist. Genealogist. Okay. So we get five results and it means that there are five women listed in the 1921 census with genealogists in their occupation field. They might not be a genealogist, they might be a genealogist assistant, for example. Let's look at the top one. We're going to look at Fanny Charlotte Bamford, born in 1858. Let's go have a look at her. And I'm going to open the original. Beautiful handwriting. Oh, look, the second person on the household has filled that out. So her signature. Um, so we've got um, Fanny Bamford here. She's 63. She's single. Uh, she seems to be joint head of the household with Harriet Thompson. She was born in London and she's listed as research work genealogical on her own account of no fixed place. Uh, you've got Harriet here as well. She's uh, an Irish resident. Uh, no occupation. And then you've got a servant as well. Uh, Ada Beatrice Smith. So that's, that's some good information, but I'm, I'm you know, my, my interest is piqued. Um, I want to find out more about this uh, geneali female genealogist in the 1921 census. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a broader search for her. So if I go to all search all records and I can't type under pressure, so my apologies. Bamford and 1858. OK. Let's have a look at her 1881 census record, shall we? So this is her in London in 1881. She's 22 and she's living with her widowed father. He's a retired publisher. And at this point, she's, you know, she's 22 years old and she's a she's a governess which is quite cool. And she's obviously not living in house. She's a daily governess or a teacher. And she's still living with her, her father and her brother here as well. So there we go. I really want to find her in 1911, though. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to pop in 1911. Do we think this is her or this is her? I'm going to go with this one. Yes, there we go. OK, so this is um, Fanny Bamford of Private Means living in Cornwall. And it's the same woman she was living with in 1921, Harriet Thompson. And there's another board. There's a boarder here called Emily. And then they've also got a nurse as well, uh, Edith Glover. So there we go. I thought that was quite fascinating, actually. Um, can you find anything more about her? I'm running out of time. So... If you would like to go and look for more details on our female genealogist, uh, fall down the rabbit hole. Let me know what you find. 
Why don't we do archaeologist? So I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to add in female again. And this is where I'm not going to type out archaeologist because I'm going to spell it wrong. So I'm just going to copy and paste from my notes because I am lazy like that. <gasps> Seven results. OK, so again, these are women in the 21 census who have archaeologists in their occupation field. OK, I'm going to go and have a look at this one. Let's look at Gertrude. So we've got Gertrude Caton Thompson. She's 33 years old. She's an archaeologist on her own account. She's living with uh, her brother because she's listed as daughter and then son. So her brother, Arthur, who's an organist. That's quite cool. And they're living in London. We can go and have a look at the original to see if there's anything else we can glean from that. No fixed place. There we go. OK. What else can we find, though? So I'm going to do a I'm going to do the same as I did before. I'm going to go and do a nice broad search. So Gertrude. Caton. This is where I forget her last name. Gertrude Caton Thompson. 1888. We'll just do it for this now. We'll just do it with her name. It's quite a distinctive name. And she actually appears in the London Gazette four times between 1946 and 1960. So immediately, this is a record set you maybe wouldn't normally think to go and look at. So if we open this, what else can we learn about her? Here she is. The king has been pleased by warrant under his majesty's royal sign manual bearing the date the seventh instant to appoint blah, 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 a member of the governing body of the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. And you can see Miss Gertrude Caton Thompson. So she's a member of the governing body of the School of Oriental and African Studies, and that was dated 1946. So that's cool. Now, what I want to do next is with a name like Kate and Thompson, it could be um, double barreled or it could be listed as this. Um, I just want to uncheck the name variants just to make sure I've not missed anything. So this is her, I think, in the 1939 register. And she's with, I think, a colleague. Uh, a university lecturer, I think that should say Cambridge. Uh, Agnes Stone, I think that says. I think the original says some, might say something else. Let's go have a look. The Bothy. I think that says Agnes Hall, actually. So, yeah, university lecturer. There we go. The next thing I want to try is searching with Caton as a middle name, not as part of her surname. And we get, we get more here. So it looks like she might have died in 1985. Uh, what else have we got here? We've got the people in the news record set. Should we go and have a look at that? So if we click on to that, this, again, is a great record collection. Um, it's basically newspaper notices. So without having to go and look at the newspaper collection, you might get some results here. So we'll go to view original article. I'm rapidly running out of time. I might not even do my third example. Um, so they're talking about women scientists here, and it says... Also, there are women who will talk about experiences amongst tribes in strange parts. Indeed, most of the adventure lectures will be by women. Miss Gertrude Caton Thompson has been aeroplaning all over the Sahara and is about to tell about her discoveries in the wilderness of Cargo, showing how men lived 35,000 years ago. That's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, people in the news. It's a good record collection. Go and use it.
Now, I did want to go and see if I could find it in the passenger list, but I ran out of time. So if you can find her, go for it. Also, spoiler alert, she has a Wikipedia page and there's a photograph of her. Now, let's, if it's okay with you, I might squeeze in one more. I know it's five o'clock, but I really enjoyed this one. So we're going to go to search and we're going to go to 1921 census. We're going to do the same thing again. And uh, I'm going to add a surgeon. And the one I want to look at is this one, Louisa Brandreth Aldrich Blake. Born in 1865, a medicine consulting surgeon on her own account. Interesting with the, the, this one, and always do this when you when you look at records. Just scroll down and see if there are any um, other records featuring that name. Hey, look, it's her 1911 census record. There we go. And if we scroll down again. We've got her in 1901. Yay! And look, even back to the age of 35, she was a physician and surgeon. I'm going to do, I'm going to wander a little bit. I'm going to go search all records. And I'm going to go Louisa Brandreth. This is where I forget her full name again. Aldrich Blake. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to get to, I think I spelled that wrong, so I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, if you look here, right, she appears in the medical register for 1913. That's a record collection I often um, forget about. Where is she? There she is, 17 Nottingham Place. So it's the same address that's on her 1911 and 1921 census records. She's one of the only women on this page. Um, I think there was another one down here. There's a Bethia Shanks Alexander down here, but um, yes, I think the rest are men. Um, so yeah, and I think there was one more thing I wanted to. No, there's two more things I wanted to show you for her. So there is. Where is it? Where have I done? What have I done with it? Yeah, it's this one. So she appears in the Great Western um, Railway Shareholders Record Collection for 1835 to 1932. And she also appears in the Knights of the Commonwealth Index. So in 1925, which was the year she died, she was awarded a DBE. So she was made a Dame. And again, if you want to read more about this incredible woman, she also has her own Wikipedia page. And there's so much more about her. So I've flown through that. My apologies. I absolutely have run out of time. I hope you enjoyed that. Next week, Daisy is going to be joining me for Friday's Live. How excited are you to meet Daisy? You've had her in the comments today and you're going to be speaking to her next week. So that's going to be really exciting. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. I hope that you all fall down rabbit holes over the weekend and look at some of these record collections that you might not have thought of before or even just go into a record set like the 39 register or the 21 census and find cool occupations for women and just see what you can find sometimes some of these stories are truly incredible and a lot of the time the stories haven't been told yet either maybe you could be the person to write somebody's wikipedia page for them so i think we'll leave it there for today um, apologies for running over i hope you all have a fantastic weekend and we will see you next week <laughs>